sometimes legal doctrine really matters. And one good example of this is the very impressive progress that was made in the area of economic, social and cultural rights in the 1980s, thanks to um, the tool that was provided uh, to understand and think about the significance of economic and social rights by a Norwegian jurist, Asbjörn Eider, who in the early 1980s was requested by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to help them understand what human rights uh, requirements uh, implied in the area of development cooperation. And Asbjörn Eider, writing initially in Norwegian for the uh, ministry, um, uh, thought about uh, a typology that would define the relationship uh, between human rights uh, and state obligations and the duty of states to uh, intervene in market relationships. Essentially, the reasoning of Ashburn Eider was um, that states had a first duty, which was to abstain from interfering with uh, the existing levels of enjoyment of human rights, and that he called the obligation to respect human rights as they were already implemented, if you wish. But then he said states also must um, intervene in sometimes in market relationships, in inter-individual relationships to protect weak parties um, uh, from their rights being interfered with by more powerful parties. The state may not remain passive when the conduct of private actors uh, results in human rights violations. And that means that there is a second duty that states must uh, uh, comply with, which is a duty to protect human rights by actively intervening on, on the market. And then thirdly, um, states should shape markets, um, uh, develop policies that lead to the full realization of human rights by um, ensuring that um, they would gradually make, make progress and that the, the, the enjoyment of the rights of the individual would gradually be, become more effective. And so, um, and that was a duty to fulfill the third level uh, of uh, state obligations that Ashburn Eider uh, put forward. And that duty to fulfill included, in some exceptional cases, a duty for the state to provide individuals with some goods or some benefits, um, um, such as uh, food parcels or, or health care um, um, or um, housing, education. Um, but in some cases, it may mean simply to ensure that the market relationships function well enough, that the markets deliver these goods that are essential for the enjoyment of the rights of the individual. So this typology of duties, the duty to respect, to protect and to fulfill, was put forward in the early 1980s and at the same time in the United States um, a philosopher Henry Shu from the University of Princeton was thinking along the same lines in a book published in in 1980 on the human rights policy of of the uh, United States um, and gradually um, the idea penetrated um, in the UN human rights system um, not least because Ashburn Eider uh, became a member of the um, Subcommission for Human Rights, the body of experts advising the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, and published in the mid 1980s, uh, the late 1980s, a few reports on the right to food in which this typology was put forward and uh, made known to a broader public. And so, uh, this um, typology uh, of states' obligations was uh, quite naturally the one that the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights um, was then inspired to use in developing the content of the right to food, as it did in a general comment uh, that it adopted in 1999, general comment number 12 on the right to food, in which the, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights interprets the otherwise quite vague wording of Article 11 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that refers to an adequate standard of living um, and that refers to the basic uh, uh, freedom from hunger that should be guaranteed by states. Um, but that right to food, that freedom from hunger, was until the late 1980s, uh, even the 1990s, relatively vague and probably too uh, abstract for states to understand exactly which implications it had for them. So the, the typology introduced by Ashburn Eider had a, um, an important impact. It, it resulted in making more concrete 
otherwise abstract obligations in giving operational content to otherwise very vague rights. And I believe that, uh, to a large extent, this typology, respect, protect, fulfill, is one that also um, is extremely useful to understand the implications of civil and political rights, such as the right of access to courts, the right to, to vote, freedom of expression, even that also requires some states that they abstain from interfering, that they protect private actors from um, conduct that might lead to violations of that, of that right, and may require from states that they adopt policies that in time will um, improve the level of enjoyment of those classically civil and political rights that I've, that I've mentioned. So this typology, uh, uh, respect, protect, fulfill, uh, which is largely structuring this course on international human rights, is one that cuts across all rights and allows uh, human rights lawyers to give, um, identify very concrete consequences that follow from the, from the guarantee or the enunciation of human rights in, in human rights instruments. And it is this typology that we will be using in the next phases of this course.